following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. This program was made possible through generous support from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Nation to Nation is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. As the first president of the United States, George Washington faced a myriad of challenges. He solidified the nation under one federal head as well as overseeing foreign relations with both European nations and the Indian nations of America. He desired to keep America free from what he termed foreign entanglements and the morass of European politics. When he took office in 1789, the vast majority of the inhabitants of the continent were native people who lived within established and complex political and social structures. While Washington may not have recognized them as equals, he understood them as viable political entities. Washington recognized Indian tribes as foreign nations and worked to establish treaties with these nations that would open the West for American expansion. 19th century westward expansion was inevitably tied to the goals of Washington and later Thomas Jefferson. Their policies would afterward be linked to the cry of manifest destiny. But how deeply rooted were Indian laws and policies? And how were they and the overwhelming surge of 19th century western settlement connected to Washington and Jefferson? These topics were explored by a panel of scholars in February 2009 at a program for educators held at the Oklahoma History Center in Oklahoma City. Our familiarity with George Washington is such that we have a hard time understanding him as human. And here is sort of why. Um, this is a 1939 image by um, Grant Wood of, uh, it's called Parson Weems' Fable. And in it we see um, Parson Weems, you know, the author of The Life of Washington, pulling aside the curtain and there's George Washington with a hatchet and his father about to take it away from him. Except if you look closely at the kid, <laughs> you see in fact that he has the head of the Gilbert Stewart portrait from the dollar bill. <laughs> so at the age of six, we see George Washington as we know him as President of the United States. So this is a myth, and it's a very powerful myth for us, this, this notion that Washington was sort of born, uh, you know, wearing britches and, uh, and ready to take command of the Continental Army. Well, of course he wasn't. And the best way to understand, I think, Washington's relationship with native people is to begin in his youth when in fact he did not have the head of the Gilbert Stewart portrait, uh, but was just an average Virginia gentry child about whom we know very little. But I do believe that between Washington's uh, youth and his 30th year, all of the most important formative experiences took place that help us understand his approach to Indians and his relationship with native peoples throughout the rest of his life. Because there are two myths that we're really dealing with here. One is this, this persistent myth of Washington, which we see s illustrated so brilliantly here. And the other is a myth that's, that's almost more powerful and that's the notion that, that um, Indians were somehow fated to vanish from the United States. That having chosen the wrong side, that is to say the British side, in the American Revolution, they become irrelevant to American history. That's a completely wrong and pernicious view. And by understanding how Washington came to meet Native people and relate to them during his life, we come much closer to understanding Native people as actors as people with historical agency. And that's the second great lesson that we can derive from studying Washington in relation to native people during this early informative period of his life. 
So that's the argument that I'll make today, um, and it begins in his youth when he f first encounters Indians in, in a certain imaginary way as a boy. And there, I believe, it's largely in context of a family myth of the Washingtons, which had to do with his great-grandfather, John, who was a, a major in the um, Virginia militia at the time of the Susquehannock War in the late 17th century, um, and was instrumental in helping to conquer um, the northern neck of Virginia, which is this area here south of the uh, Potomac River, between the Potomac and the Rappahannock. This was the frontier of 17th century Virginia, and it was, it was here that the, much of the fighting concentrated during the Susquehannock War. Washington's great-grandfather, John, was known as a consequence of his actions in this war as Conocotarius. This was a name given him by the Susquehannocks, who were Iroquoian speakers. Conocotarius means town taker or town destroyer. It was a, uh, not a name given in respect or love. It's exactly the same kind of, of uh, a name that a, oh, a, a, a Kosovar might give a Serb warlord someone of uh, great ferocity and someone of, of no particular compassion, a person who would destroy a town with children and women in it. That was Conocotarius. Washington didn't understand that really as a boy because he grew up in an area where Indians had been largely um, excluded or if they remained, remained in ways that, that were sort of fundamentally unthreatening as slaves, as servants, as, uh, as independent uh, artisans or as wage laborers, they weren't living in their own, in communities that they themselves governed, but as dependents within white communities for the most part in Washington's boyhood in the seven, early 1740s. There hadn't been an Indian war since 1676 in Virginia, and Indians were no threat as far as Washington was concerned. He first encountered them as independent people in his first um, surveying activities, which happened in the spring of 1748, when he went with um, the, the owners of the, the Northern Neck, the, the Fairfax family, on a, an expedition all the way up here in the Shenandoah Valley, which was owned, actually. This is the Shenandoah Valley, a long, 300-mile long valley in western Virginia. It was actually owned in the northern half by Lord Fairfax, Thomas Lord Fairfax, who lived just up river from the, from the uh, Washingtons and, and the, on the Potomac. And he owned all this land which needed to be surveyed. Washington was there to do that. And in 1748, when Washington is really still just a boy, about 16 years old, um, he accompanies one of the Fairfax um, parties up here um, and meets his first Indians. Uh, their war party, we think Iroquois, uh, who are coming back from war. He said they're returning with only one scalp. And he comments on their comical dancing. Um, and he obviously disdains them, condescends to them, thinks of them as, as sort of laughable savages. Um, in this, he's, he's not particularly different from any other contemporary of his day, any other teenage kid from the Virginia gentry. Um, he sees people in terms of, of difference, rather, in terms of inferiority and, as he says, comical quality. It doesn't just extend to Indians. He also says exactly the same thing. It's comical quality is the word he, the comical is the adjective he uses to describe German settlers whom he encounters at the same time. And he, he speaks of um, a, a, a group of, of frontier people who give him shelter at their house as being um, like savages. He said they slept together um, before the fire upon little hay, straw, fodder, or bearskin, man, wife, and children like a parcel of dogs or cats. So Washington, who is looking at these people, um, sees them as different from him, but also inferior and sort of funny, and whites or Indians alike as rude, uncivilized, savage. That's because of where they live. They live in wild countries, so they are wild people. And the 18th century really conceived of people in terms of the environments in which they lived. The food they ate, if you ate enough game, you became wild. If you lived in an ungoverned area, you became ungoverned. You became like a savage. These are the root 
assumptions from which Washington and his generation reason about Native people. Washington begins then um, by growing up in a place where the names are Indian names. Dog Run, for example, is the creek that runs by Mount Vernon, uh, named after the Dog Indians. Uh, he, he grows up where Indians are a memory, and he meets Indians in a way that makes him think of them as being essentially um, backward and rude and savage barbarians. This is a, 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 an initial impression that he's disabused of in the course of the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, in which he plays, as you know, an, a remarkably large role. His first mission as a, as a grown-up is to warn the French on behalf of the government of, the, of, of Virginia out of um, the Pennsylvanian West. And his mission is to keep the French, who have decided that they can no longer rely on the Iroquois Confederacy, which is based in New York, up here, claims the Ohio country down here as their hunting ground. And they have been very good at keeping Europeans out of it through this, the, the whole of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. And um, however, around the beginning, middle of the 18th century, after King George's War, um, there are increasing numbers of these traders who are beginning to appear on the lower Allegheny River. And here at the junction with the Monongahela, at the, what's called the Forks of the Ohio, where Pittsburgh is today. And the, the French can't stand for this because it, it looks like it's an infringement on, on Indian alliances that they believed um, were stable in the interior of North America. So what they do is they begin to build forts down from Lake Erie, down to, to French Creek, down to the Allegheny, down to um, the Forks of the Ohio here, Fort Duquesne. This is a means of, of attracting Indians to an alliance and making them firm in their commitment to, to the French. The Virginians, who have designs on, on that area, that in other words, who, who think of this as an area that they want to colonize one day, um, are unwilling to let that happen. And so um, the governor of Virginia sends George Washington, who's at this point only 21 years old, out to warn the French away. So he comes out in the fall of 1753 from Williamsburg all the way out here to the forks of the Ohio and, is in and intends to go all the way up here, nearly to Lake Erie, to warn the French command at Fort LeBeouf to get away. Now this is a big task for a 21-year-old kid and he needs help to do it. And the people who help him are a pair of, of native leaders who are resident at the Forks of the Ohio. Their names are uh, Tanakrison, who the English call the Half King, who is a Mingo Seneca chief, and another Mingo Seneca chief called Gayasuta, um, who lives in the same region. Now, these are both knowledgeable about the land and knowledgeable about the, the people and about the French. They're experienced diplomats and war leaders. And Washington is neither of these, so he has to rely on them. And he discovers, in fact, that they um, are part of a very complicated political circumstance. The native people who live at the forks of the Ohio are basically Delawares, Shawnees, and Mingo Seneca, all of whom are restless with the authority of the Six Nations in New York, which claim this area and would like to be independent. So what Washington doesn't understand is that he's wading into the middle of Indian politics and into the middle of Indian country, and that these people have their own agendas. And Tanakerson, the, the chief on whom he, he relies, is pro-British and, and needs desperately to have some sort of a conduit for trade goods to come into his possession, into his, into his hands, so that he can redistribute them among other native peoples and attract them to himself. See, native chiefs don't have coercive power. They can only persuade. And one of the great ways to persuade is by creating um, gift relationships with other people. And that's what Tanakrisa needs. He needs an ally. And the Virginians look like a great ally. Gaia Suta, on the other hand, is much more skeptical of the, of the English. 
Um, and so the two of them and another couple of warriors take Washington up to uh, Fort LeBeouf and he goes through the, the motions of trying to warn the, uh, the French out. And, um, and then he goes home. Well, he comes back the next year, having failed to get the French to withdraw at the head of a column of troops, uh, what's called a regiment, but it's really only a couple of hundred men, in order to, to, to move them out of, of the forks of the Ohio to eject them by force from what the French are now calling Fort Duquesne. When he gets there, he finds that things have changed, and Tanakerson, who had, who had been his, his sort of main um, point of contact, is in, the, is in the process of losing all his support, because the French are there, and the, and, and the other Indians living in the area, the Delawares, the Shawnees, the Mingos, are, are gravitating toward this French connection. So Washington and Tanakerson have a common problem now, trying to get rid of the French. Tanakerson solves this problem by murdering a French diplomatic envoy named Jumonville at a place called, now called Jumonville's Glen, which is in southwestern Pennsylvania. This has, in Tanakerson's mind, the function of creating an absolutely unbreakable uh, alliance between himself and the Virginians. But in fact, what it does is it brings the French from Fort Duquesne down on Washington and his troops like a ton of bricks. And that happens at Fort Necessity, a, a miserable little outpost um, in, um, in southwestern Pennsylvania here, uh, where on July 3rd, 1754, George Washington loses a third of his men killed and wounded in an attack led by, among others, Guy Asuta, who has at this point allied himself with the, with the French and supplanted Tanakerson as the Mingo leader. So Washington now finds himself learning a very difficult, powerful lesson, which is that Indians are extraordinarily dangerous people if you don't understand them and if you don't respect them in their, their own political ambitions. Um, this is a lesson that he learns even more powerfully the next year when he comes back as aide de camp to General Edward Braddock who's been sent from England to drive the French out of the forks of the Ohio by marching from Virginia up Braddock's Road all the way to Fort Duquesne to, to besiege them and drive them out. Of course, he doesn't make it. Less than 10 miles from Fort Duquesne, he's attacked, his column is attacked by a group that's half its size, principally Indian, and it's utterly destroyed. Braddock himself is mortally wounded. Washington shot through the coat two or three times. He has two horses shot from under him. Um, he's given the scare of his life. And this is all because General Braddock disdains Indians. When Indian people uh, try to, to um, offer their, or try to negotiate with him, try to ask um, for their, um, you know, uh, recognition of their ownership of the forks, Braddock says that he won't deal with savages, that, the, that no savage shall inherit the land. And so quite logically, they join the French and they destroy his force. When Braddock blunders into this encounter with the Indians and the French near the forks of the Ohio, um, he has almost nobody to tell him what's going on. Well, the upshot is that Washington's from then on is more or less learning difficult lessons about Indian warfare in which he understands Indians either as um, allies or as enemies. And in both instances, um, they are critical to his survival. Uh, ultimately, Washington's finest example, greatest example in this is General Forbes, who commands the British forces in the region in 1758 and who actually succeeds in driving the French from the forks of the Ohio by two means. One is to build a road and to conduct what's called a protected advance, building forts along this road all the way from eastern Pennsylvania to the forks, at the same time that he's conducting um, a series of diplomatic initiatives with, um, through the agency of Tidiaskong, a Delaware chief who lives at the, at the forks of the Susquehanna back here in the middle of Pennsylvania. Working through an Indian, in other words, to detach Indians from the French alliance is what ultimately works it to, to end the slaughter on the frontiers in the Seven Years' War. It happens because 
Forbes understands Indians as people with agendas of their own and Indians as people with um, power that he cannot break militarily. Washington then comes to understand that there is no military solution to Indian power, but only diplomatic solutions that are only um, effective if people deal with Indians in terms of their self-interest, of their ability to, in other words, to, um, to protect themselves in such a way as to make his life and the whole life of the frontier intolerable unless he understands them as people um, with their own views of their self-interest, their own views of right and wrong, and their own power. Thank you very much. As Professor Anderson said, to understand George Washington's Indian policy, we have to really begin and end with the idea that he had a very pragmatic and long studied view of Indians and their political power, their political independence, and if things went wrong, their military power. He did not take them for granted. If he started out seeing them as comical, he ended up seeing them as nations, as powerful nations, and ones that would have to be reckoned with. And by the time he became president, he had a mantra that re was repeated throughout his papers and throughout diplomatic negotiations over and over. And this is one example of, of this mantra. He said, policy and economy point very strongly to the expediency of being upon good terms with the Indians. Now you'll notice that he doesn't say morality and he doesn't say uh, my feelings toward these wonderful people point to the need to be on good terms with them. Above all, he was a pragmatist. And sometimes people search either to demonize Washington as an Indian hater or to valorize him as their protector. And I think both are wrong because really he was someone who was looking for a solution to a very complex, if not utterly intractable problem. So what exactly was the problem? The problem begins and ends, really, also, with westward migration of US settlers. In the 1790s, thousands and then tens of thousands, and in the early 19th century, hundreds of thousands of people from the United States swarm into Indian country. I'm going to be talking about two frontiers of westward movement today, but there are many others. I'm going to be talking about the New York frontier, uh, where the Senecas lived. I'll be talking about the Senecas a little. And I'm going to be talking about the Ohio Valley frontier, both of which Professor Anderson referred to uh, in an earlier period. Washington's solution to this problem, which of course created clashes over the taking of Indian land, over the hunting and overhunting of Indian uh, hunting territories, uh, over retaliation on both sides of the frontier, Washington's solution to these problems was fourfold. First was that he sought to centralize Indian relations. The American Constitution demanded that Indians be dealt with by the national government because they were nations. And we'll hear more about this uh, in the next presentation. But Washington wanted not just in constitutional principle, but also in practice to centralize Indian relations. That the people who dealt with Indians would be accountable to the national government, would be reliable in their uh, application of United States law, and could be counted on by native peoples to have the authority to make the agreements they make and to be able to enforce those. He also wanted Indians to centralize their own relations rather than a diffuse uh, political network, which is how most Indian village politics worked. He wanted there to be centralized figures in Indian country who also negotiated treaties and land sales and that they had the authority of their people to sell the lands that they sold. He wanted this for clarity. He wanted it for a lack of fraud, a lack of uh, misunderstandings. The second tenet is that he wanted to regulate land sales and trade. Uh, he wanted to regulate them on both sides, again, of the frontier. Regulating 
poor and frontier squatters and settlers, westward migrating United States citizens, and also Indians who wanted to trade to establish common principles and allow for peaceful commerce rather than the chaos that he was observing. Uh, the third principle of his policy is that he wanted to enact these through an idea of treaties and what might be called limited sovereignty. The idea of a treaty requires that it's two nations, not just two people. I can't make a treaty with you. Um, I can't go to Canada and make a treaty with Canada, or I can't go to Mexico and make a treaty with Mexico. So there is an acknowledgement on some level that Indian peoples are political entities that might be called nations, that might have some independence of uh, political authority, some independence of law, but it's limited sovereignty, because in the end, Washington does not see them as equal nations, and I assume we'll hear more about this later as well. And that leads to the fourth tenet of his Indian policy, is that Washington wanted, above all, to civilize and change the Indians from being people who relied on the hunt, as he saw it, despite the fact that Iroquois and the peoples of the Ohio Valley were agriculturalists, and in fact, their ancestors had taught European settlers to farm in North America. He wanted to teach them to farm. He also thought that they should be taught the arts of commerce, of government, to look more like the United States, to look more like civilized Anglo-American society. So if he had a policy of trying to order relations, trying to minimize warfare, trying to make negotiations fair, it was in this context of fearing war and hoping for Indian improvement. But too often we see this question of Washington's Indian policy only from Washington's perspective. We see it only from, you might say, the United States side of the frontier. I think when we consider Washington's Indian policy, we think of Washington leading a nation that looks like the boundaries of the nation today. He was president of the United States. But in fact, in 1790, most of North America was Indian country. This is a French map, uh, acknowledging this as a uh, few English or Anglo uh, or 